Well, good morning, Southeast. It is great to be in the house of the Lord together today. Great to see all of you here today. And welcome to those of you who are joining on Facebook Live and who will be watching on YouTube later. Our opening passage this morning is found in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 9. Genesis 12, 1 through 9, our opening scripture today on this beautiful Palm Sunday morning. So Genesis 12, 1 through 9. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram left as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they'd accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram set out and continued toward the Negev. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we are grateful to be in your house today. We thank you for waking us this morning and for gathering us together. And we pray that you would move in our midst, that you would accomplish your will, that you would help us to know you better, and that you would do your good and perfect work in and through us for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And I invite you to stand and to join in song.
Amen. Our psalm today is Psalm number 59, and so I invite you to turn there with me to Psalm number 59. And I want to remind you that this Friday is Good Friday, and we are having a seven last word service. And so dinner is at six, like usual. And then instead of Bible study after the dinner, we'll have a service in which we hear from seven preachers preaching seven minute sermons on the seven last words of Jesus from the cross. And so we're looking forward to that time together. Uh, Pastor Chris and Living Water Church of the Nazarene will be with us for that service as well. All right, Psalm number 59, if you have a new international version as your translation, please join with me in praying this aloud. If you have a different translation, just follow along, and then I'll pray out, and we'll close with the Lord's Prayer together. Deliver me from my enemies, O God. Protect me from those who rise up against me. Deliver me from evildoers, and save me from bloodthirsty men. See how they lie in wait for me. Fierce men conspire against me for no offense or sin of mine, O Lord. I have done no wrong, yet they are ready to attack me. Arise to help me. Look on my plight. O Lord God Almighty, the God of Israel, rouse yourself to punish all the nations. Show no mercy to wicked traitors. They return at evening, snarling like dogs, and prowl about the city. See what they spew from their mouths. They spew out swords from their lips, and they say, Who can hear us? But you, O Lord, laugh at them. You scoff at all those nations. O my strength, I watch for you. O God, you are my fortress, my loving God. God will go before me and will let me gloat over those who slander me. But do not kill them, O Lord, our shield, or my people will forget. In your might, make them wander about and bring them down. For the sins of their mouths, for the words of their lips, let them be caught in their pride. For the curses and lies they utter, consume them in wrath, consume them till they are no more. Then it will be known to the ends of the earth that God rules over Jacob. They return at evening, snarling like dogs, and prowl about the city. They wander about for food and howl if not satisfied. But I will sing of your strength. In the morning, I will sing of your love, for you are my fortress, my refuge in times of trouble. O oh, my strength, I sing praise to you. You, O oh God, are my fortress, my loving God. Amen. Father in heaven, we join with the psalmist and we testify that you are our fortress and that you are our strength and that you are the one who brings us through times of trouble. And Lord, sometimes it seems like we have people uh, against us. Sometimes it might be in the form of neighbors. It might be in the form of who we thought were friends. It might be in the form of systems. All different ways we can find ourselves feeling like we're being attacked. But Lord, our refuge is in you. And we turn to you and we trust you and we look to you. And we acknowledge that you are worthy of our trust for you are the creator, the maker of the heavens and the earth and the fullness therein. It all belongs to you, and we belong to you. That you're not just God over us, you're God over all creation. And that you didn't just create us or form us, that you created and spoke everything into being. And so, Lord, we turn to you and we cry out to you as our maker. And we thank you, Father, that you created each and every one of us with purpose and on purpose. And we pray that you would empower us to live into that purpose. Thank you that nobody here is an accident, nobody's a mistake. Uh, Lord, you saw it over each and every one of our births. And so, Lord, we thank you for the gift of life today and the purpose that you give us in living it. And then, Father, we thank you that you are the one who's enthroned above, but you stoop low and you're mindful of our every care. You are constantly engaged in our lives, and we thank you for that this morning. Thank you for places that you give us to lay our head, places and times of rest. Thank you for food, for clothing, for friends, for family. Thank you, Lord, for just all the many ways that you provide. We ask, Lord, that you'd be with those today who are in financial need, whether it's a need for a job, whether it's a need for uh, some type of financial blessing, not sure how ends are going to meet, but we pray, Lord, that you would provide and that you would make a way. Yeah. And, Lord, we look to you. And then, Father, we thank you for how you hold us together when it seems that everything would come undone. 
Uh, Lord, you stretch your arms out around and you hold us and you see us through. And so we thank you for that this morning. And then, Father, we thank you especially that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. And we confess our sins to you. We confess that we fall short of your glory. And we confess that apart from your grace, we turn against you. And so we thank you for your grace and your goodness this morning. We thank you for the gift of Jesus and of salvation. And we pray, Lord, that you would bring that salvation to greater and greater maturity within our lives. And we pray, Father, that you would help us to trust you wholeheartedly, to hold nothing back from you, to hold none of ourself back from you. And then we pray, Father, that you would increase our love for one another and that you would help us to bear with each other and to encourage each other and to strengthen each other. And Father, we thank you for those that you have brought into our lives who help us to follow Jesus more closely. Use us, Lord, to do the same for someone else. Help us to introduce someone to Jesus. Help us to uh, help someone to follow Jesus more closely. Lord, just use us to be a blessing to someone else. And Father, we bring all of our praises and our pains to you this morning. We just thank you for your goodness and your blessings upon us. Lord, I'm grateful that Vond is home. Thank you for watching over her and her travels and how you bless her and her travels. And Lord, just celebrate your goodness to us today. And Lord, we pray that you would be with families who are in need of reunions, uh, needs of homecomings. And Lord, where there is brokenness and alienation, we pray, Father, that you would bring peace and that you would bring healing. And we pray that you would bring restoration to our families. And Father, we pray that you would be with those who are on the streets today. We ask, Lord, again, that you would make a way for homecomings, a way for shelter, be with leaders, give them wisdom and insight into how best to respond to the complex situations that we find ourselves in. And Lord, for those who are incarcerated, we ask, Lord, that you would redeem the time, that you would restore the years. Again, we pray for homecomings. And we pray, Father, for those who are heartbroken, uh, family members in places that never dreamed they would be, and just the grief that's there, Lord. We pray, Father, that you would bring peace in the midst of that grief and that you would give the assurance that nobody's too far from you to reach. And we ask, Lord, that you would just draw each one unto you. Father, be with those who are facing difficult decisions today. Guide and direct their steps. Give the wisdom, the courage to step in the directions. Take the steps that you show that need to be taken. And then, Father, we pray for our world. We pray for everything going on. So many different places, so much conflict. Uh, the news has us really focused on what's happening in Ukraine. Father, we pray for there that you would bring your peace. We pray that you would turn Putin and his forces around, that you would humble him. We pray, Lord, that he would come to know who you are. And we pray for the people of Ukraine, Lord, that you would touch and that you would restore and that you would heal. And Father, we pray for leaders around the globe that you would give wisdom and insight as to how to respond in a way that would be pleasing to you, a way that would bring uh, peace, Lord. And Father, we pray for our own country and all the different things going on here. And Lord, we see division, we see hurt, we see strife, we see things getting more and more complex and more difficult. We pray, Father, again for leaders that you would give them wisdom and discernment as to what would actually be best. We pray that you would give them the humility to work together. And we pray, Father, that you would have your way. And Lord, for your church, for us here on this corner, across the street, all over the globe, Lord, we find ourselves in such challenging places, and we pray, Father, that you would empower us with your spirit to be faithful witnesses to you. May people recognize your presence amongst your churches. May people recognize your love and your salvation amongst your people. And we pray, Father, that you would accomplish that amongst us, that we would be known for your love, that we would be known for your salvation, that we would be known for you. And so that you are the one who receives honor and glory. Grant us your spirit, Lord, that you might be made known. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Again, I want to thank you for giving and thank you for just your faithfulness to the Lord in so many ways. 
And also just a reminder, you know, Good Friday service, mentioned that already, but also Easter next Sunday, we'll have lunch following the service. And so regular time, 1030 Easter service with lunch next week. Um, Pastor D is bringing the word this morning. And so looking forward to hearing the word of the Lord through Pastor D. So Pastor D, come. Good morning, good morning. Um, if you will, you can go ahead and turn with me to Matthew. Actually, keep the word up, keep the uh, question up. But um, you can turn with me to Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. Matthew chapter 21, and we will, verses 1 through 11. And as you all know, our, it is our, has become our custom to have a question um, for today. It's chapter 21, Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. It's our custom to start off with a question. And so this morning's question is this. And so those who are online, you can uh, chat the question. And those who are in service, um, you can ponder on this question. And the question is, um, what has been the most um, unexpected event or thing in your life since following Jesus? So what has been the most unexpected event or thing in your life since following Jesus? So take a moment. I know there's a lot of things you can share, but share with someone briefly what has been the most unexpected event or thing that has happened in your life since following Jesus. So take a moment. I noticed the same. <laughs> All right, I don't, I don't mean to cut your uh, conversation short. And I know that it's probably a loaded question in terms of what has been the most unexpected event or thing that has happened in your life. And one of the reasons why uh, I started off asking that question, and hopefully it, it becomes clear during our you know, time together in Matthew uh, 21 verses you know, 1 to 3, is because you know, this kind of entry, if you will, this journey, uh, most people understand it, or your Bible titles might say the triumphal uh, entry. And this is the time in which we know that Jesus is entering into Jerusalem. And so, but today, we're going to kind of adjust the title just a tad bit if you would allow me to just adjust it for a moment. And the title for today is going to be The Unexpected Journey. The Unexpected Journey. And so if you can share with someone real briefly, The, une the Unexpected Journey. The Unexpected Journey. And so let, let, let me read and then I'll talk more about this. Verse uh, 1, chapter 21 in Matthew. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage of the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied and with her coat by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. Then, he took, then this took place to fulfill what has been spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, see, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a coat, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus instructed them. They brought the donkey and the coat, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees, and they spread them on the road. 
The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Let us pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we uh, thank you for this day. Uh, Lord, thank you for this opportunity that we have to, to worship you. Uh, Lord, this opportunity that we have to come before your word. And Father, we uh, just pray, Lord, for this moment. Uh, you will allow us, Lord, to just take this journey uh, with you, uh, with your son, um, as he embarks on this journey into Jerusalem. And Lord, we, we thank you, Lord, for this uh, Palm Sunday. And Father, ask that you would indeed be glorified in, in everything that is said and done here today. Lord, we ask that you would remove any obstacles or anything that would hinder us from hearing what you would have for us to hear. In Jesus' name we pray and thank you. Amen. Amen. And so, again, this, this, this word, this unexpected journey, and it's kind of an interesting phrase, if you will, because to many at this time in the Gospel of Matthew, there's been a lot of things that have been unexpected that has happened. But the reality is, the truth there is, it has not been unexpected to God. And, and, and so I believe oftentimes in life there is what is known as the unexpected. And oftentimes in life we have or don't know what to do when the unexpected comes. And as you all begin to just think about the question that we started off today, you yourself might have many things in your life that has been unexpected. And as you've been following Jesus, kind of journeying with Jesus, it's kind of been a unexpected journey, if you will. And there's things that has happened along the way that you probably would have liked for the Lord to get rid of. There, there's probably things in your life that you've been cheerful of, you've been praising the Lord for. But the reality is, God knew all along. Amen. And, and, and sometimes that can become very challenging. It can be a test of our faith because especially in the times of uncertainty, Lord, did you know? Did you expect this or that to happen? And again, it may have caught many by surprise during the ministry of Jesus, but it didn't catch God by surprise. And, and one of the things that you, you will notice if you're going and journeying through the Gospel of Matthew is that to the disciples, there's been a lot of unexpected things that has happened, right? They've been following this one in whom has told them to follow me. And they have followed, they've been faithful, have maybe at times been doubtful and complaining and wanting to, you know, be great in their own ways and wanting Jesus to do for them kind of their expectations of him. But the reality is, you also kind of see a transformation taking place in a disciple's life as well. As they continue to journey with Jesus, as the same way as we continue to journey with Jesus, our lives, hopefully, are being transformed. Our lives, too, are being renewed. And our expectations of him changes as well. Right? And, and in our story today, it, it, it's pretty remarkable in the way in which Matthew sets this story up, but then also kind of um, brings us to this place. And I want to just take a moment to just give some quick insights of the Gospel of Matthew. So just in case if you're doing Matthew as a Bible study or talking to someone, you kind of have some things you can kind of, you know, glean on and then also kind of point to, to kind of launch you or others into the Gospel of Matthew. And one of the things about getting Matthew's Gospel is Matthew has some key verses, right? You might say key verses, all the verses in Matthew should be key because it's God's spoken word. Yes, that is true. But there's key verses in Matthew that kind of help the reader, help the audience kind of hear Matthew afresh, hear Matthew anew, right? And, and one, of the, one of those verses I'll start off with is chapter 3, verse 17. And, and you all may know that that is the, the time before Jesus actually enters into uh, the wilderness being tempted by Satan, that there is this voice that comes from heaven and says, this is my beloved son, and in whom I am well pleased. 
And, and we get this, this voice from heaven. And, 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 and we know, because of Matthew, that this voice is not, again, unexpected. Because it was a, a, a time and a place in which God will kind of declare, confirm who Jesus was. And, and this is Jesus' identity, if you will, being confirmed as the Son of God, but also as the Messiah, the triumphing Messiah, who is to come and to humble himself and to give himself as a ransom for many. And so in this one verse, you have kind of all those things kind of taking place. And then if you jump, now there's more we can say, but then if you jump to chapter 17, verse 5, one of the things you would notice again is you get this declaration from heaven. You get this voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. But this time there's an additional part to it. It says, and listen to him. And so now we see that there's been this, this change, especially this attachment, listen to him. And so now this message indeed is for the disciples who are there hearing this message. But then I believe it also is for us today as well. That this one in whom God has sent his, his, his one and only begotten son, we are called to listen to him. So that, so that doesn't mean that we listen to him when things are going right. We, we listen to him when things are not going right. We listen to him in the expected, but we also listen to him in the unexpected times as well. And the, the challenge becomes for us as disciples, even today, is how do we follow Jesus in times of uncertainty? Another way of looking at that is how having the faith to follow Jesus in uncertain times. And we ourselves are living in uncertain times today. Yeah. Unexpected. If, if you can be honest and raise your hand, did you expect everything that is taking place today to happen? No. No. Because, it's, it, because at some level, it's been unexpected to all of us. Yeah, we've been told by the word of God there's going to be various things that would happen, but none of us knew when it would happen, when this or that would take place. And so for all of us, it's been unexpected. But in the unexpected times of life, having the faith to follow Jesus is not always easy. And for the disciples, again, the same for us. It's the same. Faith in uncertain times, following Jesus in the unexpected. And then I want to take a quick moment to um, point our attention to two, two other verses before going somewhere else. Uh, chapter 4, verse 17. So, so this is um, one verse, and I think, it's, I think the phrase kind of is put, from this time Jesus began to do this, this, and this. And this is the moment, chapter 4, verse 17, where Jesus actually launches into his earthly ministry. He just came from being tempted uh, in the wilderness by Satan. And now we get this verse, verse 17, that says basically from this time on, and so Jesus began to launch into his earthly ministry. Right? And the, the next verse is chapter 16, verse 21. And the reason why we're doing this is because it really does set up context for our time today. Um, especially in chapter 21 and then other verses as well. So chapter 16, verse 21, um, you, you get the same phrase from this time on. But at this point, it's no longer, in essence, talking about Jesus' earthly ministry, if you will, even though he's still ministering. Now the, the shift, as Pastor Steve would, have, would put it, the turning point at this point would be Jesus now disclosing to his disciples his death and resurrection. So there's been a turning point, there's been a shift in the Gospel of Matthew from chapter 4, verse 17, all the way now to chapter 16, verse 21. And now Jesus is clearly talking to his disciples about his death and his resurrection. Up to this point, the disciples, in essence, it has been an unexpected journey. And they've been following Jesus but yet, only God knew what was coming. Only God knew the journey that was ahead. And there's other things that I would uh, read, 
but I want to launch into just, you know, our verses today. And so hopefully that kind of brings us to our um, verses in Matthew chapter 21 today um, in terms of just this, this unexpected uh, journey that is here. And one of the things we see in verse 1, it says, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, that Jesus sent two disciples. So two things here that I highlighted. We can highlight a lot, but I don't want to uh, prolong your time here this morning. But two things. One, they drew near to Jerusalem. Key. If you have a highlighter, highlight it, underline it, however you want to. Because there was three different times before this chapter that it talked about what's going to take place in Jerusalem. So there was an expectation of what would happen in Jerusalem. But again, it was unexpected. So, so verse uh, 16, 21, of course, there was Jesus foretelling his death, his resurrection, and also just how everything would take place. Uh, also in chapter 17, verses 22 to 23, Jesus is now, this is the second time talking about foretelling his death, uh, how everything would take place, and also his resurrection. Uh, chapter 20, verses 17 through 19, that was the third time Jesus predicted and told for, foretold his death, his resurrection, and just how everything would take place at this particular time, right? And so we have this. And so now we begin to kind of really um, get a picture of why Matthew would make sure by, of course, divine inspiration that this is important for us to know that they're nearing Jerusalem. Because we see that as he's going into Jerusalem, as they are approaching Jerusalem, we know what's going to take place. That, that, that Jesus is going to be crucified. That he's going to be rejected. He's going to be condemned. He's going to be spit on. And all of this was taking place. And Jesus faithfully, in humility, continued to approach Jerusalem. And I know oftentimes in life we, 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 we might say that if I knew what the Lord would want me to do, I'll do it. It, it, do you have that same testimony that if I somehow knew what God wanted me to do, I would actually do it? And, and, and the thing is, I don't know if that's true. Be, because if you were the son of God, as Jesus points himself out as the son of man, and you knew that death was approaching and you're were, you were going to be crucified, would you actually be faithful and go? Because I think today we oftentimes avoid suffering at all costs. But, 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 but for Jesus, it seems as if he's embracing this moment of suffering. That, that, that he's humbling himself to the will, to the plans of the Father. Through and through. It's not unexpected to Jesus, but to his followers, to maybe the hearers at this time, it was unexpected what was to come. Because their expectations was different. And we're going to see that in a moment. But again, today, if God was to, in essence, explain to you everything that's going to happen from today, at this moment, moving forward, would you want to know? Be, 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 would you want to know? And it's a scary thing to think about, but not so much just knowing what's to come but trusting in the one that knows. And, and I think that's what's on full display here, that Jesus knows the one who knows what's coming. And he trusts himself into the Father's hands, even to death on a cross. And that's faith. And, and I think one of the strongest messages that is here is faith is trusting in Jesus, even when we do not know what is ahead. Faith is trusting in Jesus even when we do not know what's ahead. Pastor Steve opened up with Genesis chapter 12 this morning. Abraham's story. We oftentimes read Abraham's story. Abraham didn't know what God was, where God was calling him to. But faith in the one who called him allowed him to go. He didn't know what was ahead for him, but yet he entrusted himself into the Father's hands and he went. And, and it's amazing that Jesus continues to go even though he knows what's ahead. But for us today, the question becomes, will we trust Jesus? Will we have faith in Jesus even when we do not know 
what lies ahead. And then the second part of this um, verse one, it says Jesus sent two disciples. And we don't know just yet, but we'll see in verse two where he's actually going to send them. But he has the authority given to him by the father to commission, to send. And one of the good news is here is whenever the Lord sends, whenever the Lord calls, he also equips those in whom he calls. And, and, and so you and I, my sisters and brothers, this morning, when the Lord calls us to this or that, don't be afraid. And the reason why we should not be afraid because we know the one who's calling. We know the one who's sending us. And so if he's been faithful before, then what makes us think today he won't be faithful again? If he was faithful to Abraham when he called Abraham, what makes us think that he wouldn't be faithful to us? Faith. Trusting in Jesus in times of uncertainty. And yet in the moment, we see verse 2, it says, saying to them, these are the disciples, he says, go to, into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey and a coat with her. Untie them and bring them to me. Three, four, actually, Pacific instructions. He, he called them to go. The next thing he says, find the donkey, you will immediately find it, untie it, and then bring it to me. Pac specific instructions for the disciples at this particular moment. And again, one of the uh, kind of uh, amazing things here is, I don't know about you, but this don't make sense to me. I I I'm sorry, but it doesn't make sense. Jesus' instructions, yes, very clear, very direct, very specific. But go into the city ahead of you and go get two donkeys, donkeys that are tied up and bring them to me. Does that make sense to you? If somebody was to tell you to go do this, would you do it? But it's fascinating that even when it may have not made sense to them, they did it. They did it. And again, I begin to see this transformation that is taking place in the disciples' life because this is not the same disciples we've always seen. We've seen the disciples who may at times have questioned Jesus. But you remember that word from heaven? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. So that means no matter what he tells you to do or instructs you to do, your response is to say, yes, listen to him. And here it is, the disciples, at this moment, it says, we'll, we'll get there. But Jesus eventually tells them, if anyone says anything to you, say, the Lord needs them, and he will send them. It says, if anyone tells you, what are you doing, just say, simply, the Lord needs them. And now at this point, we don't know um, foolproof whether... It kind of was already orchestrated. You know, someone knew Jesus, whether it was a disciple of Jesus or disciples of Jesus that had this location, and Jesus already kind of had it planned and, you know, prepped, prepared. And so a way of already things are already prepared and ordered. Or is it kind of Jesus already just knowing exactly what would happen, what they would say in response to him, and then also we, we, we just know that Jesus, like God, knows everything. So we, we, we don't oftentimes know just every full detail here. But the reality is this phrase, the Lord needs them. Now, I don't know about you, but that's an interesting phrase. The Lord needs them. Because I don't oftentimes think about God being needy. But, but it says in this moment, the Lord needs them. And so what is it that Jesus and why is it that Jesus is sending his disciples at this point, this moment, and instructing them to go and get, um, find this donkey and this coat with her and untie it and bring it to her? Because Jesus knows the journey that's ahead. The disciples may not know the journey that's ahead, but Jesus already knows the journey that's ahead. And he also knows, too, that what is going to be fulfilled by him riding into Jerusalem on this donkey. He knows. The disciples don't know, but yet, again, I'm amazed that they followed. And 
another thing, second point is faith is trusting in Jesus even when it does not make sense. <laughs> I, I can imagine back in the Old Testament when Abraham was called by God to go, it didn't make sense. Be because oftentimes when we are in a place of comfort, a place of familiarity, a, ma a place when things are predictable, we want to stay. But, but, but the call to Abraham is out of all of that and to go. And it didn't make sense. But faith is trusting in the Lord even when it does not make sense. And the disciples, I believe, were an example for us today of trusting in Jesus in times when it didn't make sense. And then I think going to verse 4, it says, This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you humble and mounted on a donkey, a coat, the foal of, this translation say, a beast of burden. A couple of things I highlighted. Again, there could be a lot of things we can discuss. One is to fulfill. We just discussed that, that here it is in and through Matthew. One of the things that you will see is this fulfillment language. And Jesus continues to, Matthew continues to portray show forth, display Jesus as the fulfillment of a lot of things that were spoken long before. And in this moment, you know, at this, this, this phrase, uh, Zechariah uh, chapter 9, verse 9, and so at this particular time, they were in expectations of a king who would come, Messiah, the anointed one, to come, mounted on a donkey, the foal of a donkey, and being victorious. And here it is, that Matthew was showing that Jesus is actually fulfilling this very prophecy, if you will, at that particular time of Jesus coming into Jerusalem mounted on a donkey. And there's a lot there in that passage. One, one of the things it says, it says, say to the daughter of Zion. And I believe that one of the things, too, when, you, when I hear the word say, what that means to me is praise. <laughs> praise. This is, a, this is not a time of weeping, but this is a, a moment in which we should praise God for what he is doing in and through his anointed one. So as Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, this is a moment to praise God for what he's doing. Because in and through Jesus at this particular moment, as he's entering into Jerusalem, this is a moment of praise, of worship, celebrating, thanking God for answered prayers. And, and, and Matthew doesn't go there uh, at this particular moment, but there's another uh, verse there, and it says, shout. So they're not only to say it, praise it, if you will, but they're to shout it. And when I hear, about, when I hear shout, I think of proclaim. Th this is a moment to proclaim what God is doing and how God is fulfilling the very things that he has spoken. So they're supposed to praise, they're supposed to proclaim, and watch this. It says, behold. When I think about behold, I think about perceive. So they're supposed to praise, they're supposed to proclaim, they're supposed to perceive that which the Lord is doing. And all those things are happening at this moment in Jesus entering into Jerusalem on this donkey. Matthew, 20, uh, Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. And so it also shows us at this particular uh, fulfillment that Jesus is holy, that he's having, in essence, coming with salvation and bringing salvation. And then I believe it also shows us the humility of this one whom is to come, that he's coming not on a horse, you all know this. He's not coming on a horse. Because to come on a horse would say what? I, I, I'm coming to destroy. I'm not coming to bring peace, in essence, but a sword. That, that, that's kind of what that would say, that I'm, I'm, I'm coming to declare war, if you will. But he's coming mounted on a donkey, symbolizing humility, but also symbolizing that he is the Prince of Peace, that, that, that he's coming to bring peace. And, 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 it's, and it's very powerful because 
those at this time, their expectations of Jesus was not one who would come mounted on a donkey. They would rather him come on a horse because they knew that it would liberate them, free them, set them free from the oppression that they were under. Isn't, ama isn't, isn't it amazing how we oftentimes have our expectations of God and what God should do and who God should be at this particular season in our lives? It's amazing. But again, having faith to follow Jesus through times of uncertainty, again, is not easy. And it wasn't easy for the disciples at this particular time. They had their expectations. The crowd had their expectations. But God already knew what was to come. Amen. So w w what do you do in life when, you're, when God's way of doing things are operating does not fit with what you think he should be doing? Do you continue to trust him? Do you continue to trust that his ways are higher than your ways? That his, his, his thoughts, his, his ways are not your ways, his thoughts are higher than your thoughts. That he doesn't operate as we would want him to operate? Do you continue to trust and have faith and say, Lord, I'll continue to follow you through and through, even though, Lord, you're not moving the way I believe you should be moving? Will you continue to trust him? Trusting God through the unexpected journeys in life is not easy. My dad used to have a funny phrase, and when I was young, he it used to be funny, but it was actually, you know, now it actually, you know, kind of profound, you know, in a sense. But he used to say, and again, we thought it was funny, but he used to say, if I knew it was coming, I would have baked the cake and had a birthday party. <laughs> and, and, and I know for you all probably it sounds silly because it sounded silly to us at the time, but one of the things that I believe he was trying to share or instruct that if he knew it was coming, he would have prepared better for it. He would have readied himself for that which has happened. But he knew that in life, the unexpected would happen. He, he knew in life to expect the unexpected. If he only knew it was coming. And I can imagine that when, when, when he was alive, there was things that he didn't expect to come. He didn't expect cancer to come. It was unexpected, but to the Lord, it was not. If he knew it was coming, he probably would have prepared better, probably would have did things differently, but it came unexpectedly. And it came to all of us, our family in particular, at a time in which we didn't even know, but the Lord knew. And in those moments in life when the unexpected happens, are you able to trust God through those uncertain times? And, and, and Jesus is very, even beyond what my father was to us, to his disciples. That, that, that it became a moment of confusion for them because it's like, how can the strong one, the one in whom we look to, the one in whom spoke words of peace over us, the one who protected us, how is it that he's going to die? So, so you can imagine at those moments, the disciples are wrestling with a lot. And you can imagine for me at that time, I was wrestling with a lot. Wondering, Lord, how, how, how can you be good, yet allow this unexpected situation to happen? So, so you, you, you see, how, how do you continue to keep faith in times of uncertainty. Because I'll be lying to you if I told you I knew exactly what was coming. I knew exactly that I'll be standing here giving this message today following the death of my father. But I didn't know. But there was one who did. That, that, that oftentimes through the hurt and the pain and the suffering, God utilizes it for good. And he knows. And you yourself have your own stories. You yourself have your own testimonies through this, in essence, unexpected journey in life. If you only knew that that situation was coming, would you have prepared differently? Would you have made different decisions? The disciples. There was once where Peter even said, Lord, we left everything to follow you.
Are you willing to leave everything to follow him? Even to the point where you know he's headed to be crucified. And when I think about that, 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 that verse, that fulfillment verse that's here, faith is trusting in Jesus, believing that he is the fulfillment of God's spoken word, spoken and written word. I'll say it again. Faith is trusting in Jesus, believing that he is the fulfillment of God's spoken and written word. When, when, when Abraham was sent by God, he trusted in God's spoken word. God didn't write it down to Abraham. God just re revealed himself, showed forth himself to Abraham and said, you must go. And Abraham trusted in the one who called him and sent him to go. And that same question, that same challenge for us today is will we trust God and believing that Jesus is the fulfillment of what all that God has spoken and written. Verse 6, it says, The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. Now, I would probably say this is probably one of my favorite verses in all of these 11 verses. And I oftentimes might even say this is my favorite verse. And it, it's for a reason. Because here it is that we saw that Jesus instructed the disciples to go. To untie the donkey. To bring it to him. And then now verse 6 it says the disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. Come on, we, we, we're talking about the disciples. They, they were no different at times than you and I where they began to have their own ambitions, their own dreams, their own expectations of Jesus. But yet right here, it seems different in verse 6. It says the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. We're talking about the ones who were blind, who could not see who Jesus was. Right before this story, here, we get a story of two blind men. Pastor Steve took us through a great uh, time on Friday nights in terms of these two blind men that, that were healed by Jesus. And at that moment, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. Yet blind, they still were able to see. They were still able to recognize who Jesus was, although their vision was impaired. But the disciples who had the ability to see, yet did not see. But now I see in verse 6 it says, the disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. And then I think, what does that say? I believe it says, faith is trusting in Jesus even when we cannot see. Amen. Faith is trusting in Jesus even when we cannot see. Amen. Because there's moments in life, and you yourself, again, are a testament to this, that there's these unexpected events in life and things that happens in life, and it's trusting in Jesus even though you can't see your way out. And I'm trusting that, Lord, despite this situation, you're going to bring me through. That despite the circumstance that I'm dealing with, Lord, you're going to bring me out. That despite what I'm facing, Lord, you're going to make a way. Abraham, get out and go to a place that's unfamiliar to you. Abraham does it. Doesn't know how the Lord's going to provide. Doesn't know how the Lord is going to show up, but he goes. And the Lord shows up. The Lord provides. Even though Abraham at times tried to make you know, things happen on his own terms. But yet, he still trusted in the Lord even though he could not see. And that's, that's faith. And my sisters and brothers this morning, I pray again that, that you will allow the Lord to empower you with his spirit. To trust him. Especially in moments in life when you cannot see. And the disciples, I believe, were in a perfect example for us today of trusting in the Lord, doing that which he says, even when they did not know how the Lord was going to provide and make a way. The one who calls is faithful, and he will do it. And the, and, and the way he did it for his disciples at this time, we have to have that same trust and faith that he would do it for us today. But it's up for us to go. It's up for us to do it, not in our own terms, and I believe the reason why their mission was successful and I re believe why our missions today are successful is because of the one in whom we go in. They went in the name of the Lord. 
and, and, and you, you heard the phrase that says, the Lord needs them. And the reason why they were able to accomplish that which he was sent them to do is because they won in his name. I mean, can you imagine? I don't know which disciples it was. It doesn't tell us. I don't think it's important for Matthew at this point. I don't think it's important for us. But maybe there's a reason why they didn't uh, identify the disciples. But can you imagine if it was Peter saying, I need them? They wouldn't have got the donkeys. Because Jesus' instructions was to say, the Lord needs them. And so he wasn't going in Peter's name. He wasn't going in John's name. But he was going in Jesus' name. And anytime we go in Jesus' name, we have to have trust and faith that that which we are sent to do, the Lord is going to be faithful in bringing us through it. Verse 7, it says, They brought the donkeys in the coat, they brought the donkeys in the coat and put them on, uh, and put on their cloaks and sat, and he sat on them. Jesus sat on them. And this is kind of funny. Um, at times, but I don't, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But some may think that when it says he sat on them, that he sat on the donkey in the, the coat, like he's riding on two animals. <laughs> but hopefully as you read and I read, the way in which probably the idea way of reading it is when the disciples placed their cloaks on the, the donkey in the coat that Jesus sat on one animal. He didn't sit on two. So he wasn't kind of surfing his way into Jerusalem. So he sat on the cloaks, sat on them. And so, yeah, I just want to bring that to your attention because you may come across that at some point. But here it is again. They brought the donkeys to Jesus and did exactly what um, Jesus instructed them to do. And, 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 I'm, and I'm amazed because, again, here it is. The disciples are doing something that I think is very fascinating. Because at some level, they don't know what's happening. And then at some level, it seems like they know something. Because to place your cloaks on an animal, yeah, it might be that they want to make sure Jesus stay clean and all those things. But it almost seems as if they got a little glimpse that this entry into Jerusalem may very well be what we call a triumphant entry. Who knows? It doesn't say, I'm just speculating just a tad bit, but let me move on and see what the crowd does. And so verse eight, it says, most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And so it seems that's what the disciples did. It seems like the people also did a very similar thing and then also even more, cutting down what we call today Palm Sun, uh, Sunday, and so they kind of laid it out. And so now they're seeing Jesus as a king because the way in which they're operating and kind of preparing the way is what you would do for someone of authority, especially a king. You would kind of prepare the way, make way for the one to come through. And so it's fascinating that the crowds, although they, are, they, don't, also, they don't know everything to do, or everything to say about this Jesus, but yet their actions almost seems as if they kind of got it or they understand a little bit about what's taking place. But I believe a big part of this is it shows their expectations. It shows the longing of their hearts. Because again, they've been waiting. They've been expecting that the Lord would send someone to set them free. Have you given up? H have you given up that the Lord is going to be faithful to that which he has spoken? Yes, you've been, you've been longing, you've been waiting, you've been praying that the Lord would answer this prayer, answer this prayer. But have you given up? And it's amazing that even though, it, even though there's been periods and moments, it seems as if God has not spoken, they still held hope that the Lord will fulfill that which he has spoken. There's, there, there, there's some level of hope. And then verse 9, it says, the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. 
I mean, I can imagine at this point, the disciples are probably like, wait a minute. There's, there's more to this Jesus than just him being our friend. You, you know those friends that you may have that call Jesus their friend and that's all they look at him and think he is? Or the ones that, I'm not going to say it, well, Jesus is their boyfriend. and yeah, You got a lot of things that people say about Jesus, right? But this shout is saying, Hosanna to the son of David. This word, Hosanna. They're expecting Jesus to come and save them. Oh, oh, save us, son of David. And, and, and we kind of can look into it, but we, we kind of can begin to see that the people, wait a minute, they're hoping and they're remi- remembering that God had promised David that there would always be someone who would remain on the throne, fulfill the throne. And so it almost seems like they're seeing Jesus as this fulfillment of what God has spoken, being that son of David. Save us. And it's amazing because Matthew, I mean, he really does, by, again, by, by um, the grace of God, really kind of brings us to this, this place and allow us to actually take this journey with the crowd, with the disciples, and then also with Jesus as well. Because the first, one of the first things we see about Jesus is that his name is Jesus, and he's going to be one who's going to save his people from their sins. And here it is, they're saying, oh, save us. I wonder if they're really saying, oh, save us from our sins. Or they're just saying, oh, save us from the oppression that we're in. You, you see the difference? That, that there's moments in our life where we're asking God to save us from this situation or that situation. And then hopefully there's those real moments where we're asking the Lord to save us from ourselves. Save us from our sins. Save us from that which the Lord has came to set us free from. And, and here's the beautiful thing, is that the disciples were sent to loosen the beast of burden, but Jesus came to loose, to set us free from the beast of sin, from the burden of sin. They're setting free this, this beast of burden, but Jesus came to set us free from the burden of sin. And, and that only came through the song that we sang. One of the songs that we sang, there's power in the blood. And, and the only way we're going to be set free, liberated from our sins is in and through the power of the blood. It's the blood that sets us free. It's the blood that has made a way. Oh, Hosanna, son of David. And then they said, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But just this recognition that Jesus, son of David, but also that he comes in the name of the Lord. They were able to recognize the way in which he lived, the way in which he conducted himself, the way in which he spoke, that he was very different than those in whom of their day. Different than the Pharisees, different than the Sadducees, different than the scribes. And it was something Jesus, different about Jesus than everyone else. Is there a distinct difference between you and others? Can people see your life, the way in which you live, the way in which you speak, the way in which you conduct yourself, the way in which you live through uncertain times? Are they able to identify you as a child of God? Are they able to recognize? But for Jesus, it seems that they were able to see. He's the real deal. And then it goes and says, Hosanna in the highest. Verse 10, it says, and when he entered into Jerusalem, Jesus, as he's entering into Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? Now it's kind of like the truth is coming out some. Who is this? And again, I wish you all were all here on Friday because Pastor Steve took us through this course of this question in the Gospel of Mark, but the question as well in the Gospel of Matthew is, who is this? (laughs) We've seen Jesus' Jesus' disciples kind of have to already answer this question, Peter in particular, who, but who do you say I am? And, And Peter responds and says, you are the Christ. 
Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, Peter, but my father revealed this to you. But the crowds at this point, it doesn't seem like they get it. Or at least it doesn't seem like they, they got it. And the disciples as well, it still don't seem like they got it either. And one of the messages, too, from Friday that really hit home is that even in the midst of them not getting it, having their own expectations of who Jesus is, Jesus was still patient and loving to them. And I believe he still does the same for us today. Patient, loving, not willing that any should perish. So that all may come to know who he is. <laughs> so when we're, when we're asked this question, who is this? We can say, he is my Lord and Savior. <laughs> but, but do you have that declaration today? Do you have that testimony today to say that Jesus is indeed your Lord, Lord and Savior? Not just with the mind. Because you know what he's done. You know what God has sent him to do. But you know it. Oh, he is my Lord and Savior. But do you know it here? Do, do you know it here? Because it's one thing in our lives to lay down our cloaks. And, and, I, and I believe this. Jesus, this is good. And, and, and we're going to lay down our cloaks for Jesus. Right? We're going to lay down our cloaks for Jesus. But I believe the thing that Jesus really wants us to lay down is our lives. Amen. He wants our hearts. Amen. Cloaks, good. But he wants our heart. And so as you think about this this morning, have you truly laid down your life for him? Because he did it for you. And he was the ultimate example of what it means to really lay down our lives. And so I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit that the Lord will empower each and every one of us to truly, truly lay down our lives this morning. And I know you may have things to do. I know you may have places to go. But before you do so, may you lay it down. Amen. These uncertain times, may you lay it down. Whatever it may be, we have altars here for a reason. Don't be so quick to leave, but allow the Lord to speak to your heart afresh this morning, saying, Lord, what is that in my life that you would like me to lay down in these unexpected times? Lord, I know things in my life are not going the way I want them to go, how I want them to go, but Lord, would you allow me to lay it down? Would you allow me to trust you, Lord, in moments of uncertainty? Lord, the crowds are saying, this is the prophet, Jesus of Nazareth of Galilee, but Lord, I want to know you more than just a prophet. Lord, I want to know you as the king of kings. Lord, I also want to know you as my savior. And how did he become savior? Not by just being a prophet, not just by being a king, but by being a servant. Jesus says before this, he says, the son of man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He laid down his life. And I, and I wish I had some time, because we can talk about Jesus as prophet, we can talk about Jesus as king, and then we can also talk about Jesus as priest, and what do those things mean. But he's more than just a prophet. He's the son of God. the one in whom humbled himself and gave himself even to death on a cross. So faith, last point, faith is trusting in Jesus for who he is and not what we or others want him to be. For who he truly is, not for who we want him to be. Lord, help us. And so, before we uh, depart today, I actually want Pastor Steve to come up and give uh, 
kind of the benediction and closing thoughts. I'll pass out uh, communion and we can have communion together. But I want to read these last verses, uh, last verses and this will be it. This is uh, Philippians chapter 2. It says, if you have any, any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in one spirit and purpose, doing nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, considering others better than yourselves. Each of you, each of you, each of you, me, is, me included, look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider himself an equality with God, something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in the appearance as man, he humbled himself. It said he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him in the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. 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 We're going to uh, have communion at this time. And so, Pastor Steve, would you mind? Yeah, I invite you to just let Pastor Dean know if you'd like to receive the elements, the bread, the cup that represent our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And as they sing, uh, just go ahead and, and pray and surrender to the king, whatever the king might be talking to you about.
Let's pray. Our gracious and holy Father in heaven, we thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die on the cross for our sins. And Jesus, we confess that you are Lord and that you are Savior. And we acknowledge that so often you work in ways that we don't expect and ways that we don't understand. Help us to live surrendered to you. Help us to live fully trusting in you. Help us to know that you know better than us. And we pray, Father, that you would accomplish your expectations in our lives for your glory. Help us to relinquish to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. On the night that our Lord was betrayed, he was gathered in the upper room with his disciples celebrating the Passover meal. And Jesus took the bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, Take and eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. And in like manner, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he said, Take and drink. This is my blood, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me I once was lost but now I'm found was blind but now I see now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you all in Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 God bless. Have a great week. Hope to see you Friday night for Good Friday service. Amen.